The 21st century is the century of science and innovation. That's where all our wealth is going to come from. It's not as widely recognised as it should be, and it certainly isn't acted upon by governments. Having said that, it's also just as true of agriculture as it is of any other sector. We have some enormous challenges ahead of us. Um, we have now over a billion people who are chronically hungry. And we know that we're going to have to more or less double food production by 2050 because of the increase in population and per capita incomes. That's a huge challenge. And part of that challenge is to produce new crop varieties and new animal breeds. We're going to need new varieties that are more efficient at using sunlight, more efficient at using nit nutrients, nitrogen and so on, more efficient at using water that are more resistant to pests, diseases and weeds, that are more nutritious and are more tolerant of heat and drought and flooding and the other effects of climate change. And to get those new varieties, we're going to need all the science and innovation that we can get. Science and innovation has really gone global. Uh, it's also about teams. It's not just about the sort of lone inventor dreaming something up in the bath and going out and trying it the next day. These are quite complicated teams that bring together different disciplines. And it's global in the sense that we now have big actors, not just in terms of the industrialised world of the United States and Europe and Australia and so on, but we've now got China and India and Brazil and South Africa and South Korea and Vietnam and other emerging countries who have their own innovative capacities. And so, in a sense, what we're trying to do is to get all of those to work much better together. If we go back to the Green Revolution of the 1960s and 1970s, uh, that was a very technologically driven revolution. It came about because of the breeding of short strawed wheat and rice varieties in particular, which had a great capacity to take up large amounts of nutrients, nitrogen in particular, and produce very, very high yields. And because of that, uh, countries like India were able to feed themselves, and as a whole, the world food production kept up with population increase. And of course, it was also true that many parts of the world didn't benefit from the Green Revolution. Uh, Africa was passed by, and even South Asia, large parts of South Asia, didn't really benefit. And so what I've been arguing is that we need a new Green Revolution, but what I would call a doubly Green Revolution. We need a Green Revolution that is uh, not just highly productive, we have to have that, but it's one which is environmentally friendly.